over 200 attendees from 40 team member institutions that today kick off, well, day one of TEF. Uh, as you probably know, online learning in Ontario is growing faster than any other province in Canada. 79% of colleges and 88% of universities forecast an increase in online course registrations in the next year. And that was according to the Canadian Dis uh, Association of, I can't remember, what do you call that? The, uh, the Canadian National Group that does the survey across Canada, the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association. That was their 2018 study. And you get a chance uh, today at noon to hear from Dr. Tricia Donovan, who is leading that group and will provide you the 2019 stats for Ontario. This growth in registrations is coupled with a growth in new strategy for creation, delivery, recognition, and collaboration for online learning across the province, necessitating innovative learning tools, and in particular, an experimenter mindset. We need to actually harness the creativity of our faculty. They are the engines of innovation on our campuses. TEST 2019 is our opportunity to celebrate that success extend our horizons and mobilize our collective knowledge to build future online learning environments that are even more inclusive, engaging, and digitally fluent for our students. Today, today's theme is leveling up Ontario's higher education game. And day one of TEST offers a showcase of excellence in online learning from colleges and universities across Ontario in the form of presentations, panels, and Ignite sessions. Day two of TEST tomorrow, which many of you will also attend, provides a highly interactive small group learning experience using Pressbooks and H5P, free and open source content collaboration technology. Activities completed on day two will count towards our Ontario Extend Experimenter Bag. All in all, this is gonna be a highly interactive two days. You get to meet some new colleagues, and you really get a chance to roll up your sleeves and just have some fun. We selected uh, our keynote speaker for today based on a conversation that Lena Patterson and I had with Laurie Phipps from JISC in the UK. Laurie is a collaborator and a, a great person in professional learning circles. Uh, JISC is the UK's eCampus-like organization. Uh, that works with both technology and professional learning. And he had been working closely with uh, Dr. Donna Langclos and uh, wanted us to consider that we might think about someone different as a keynote speaker, not necessarily focused primarily on technology, but more on the context in which we work and learn. Dr. Donna Langclos comes to us in the University of North Carolina libraries when we asked our colleague Lori, who might be an interesting keynote speaker, she said, Donna. Donna comes of Kent from Anodyne Anthropology and is an anthropologist in, in the machine. Her field sites include education and the digital landscape it inhabits. Her role in these machines of education and digital is to understand how they work, how people interact with the cogs and wheels of processes and ultimately to ensure that the machine is serving humanity rather than the machine itself. She argues for a move to decenter technology in discussions of teaching and learning, a challenge at a time when colleges and universities are developing new strategies for digital at a prodigious rate. Putting staff under constant pressure to innovate in their practice, practice is counterproductive, according to Donna, if what we actually want and need is creativity. With that intro, I invite you to welcome Dr. Donna Langley. Thanks so much. Thanks. Good morning. Ah, oh, you guys are good. We have we have the A team over here on uh, audio and visual, so just you know we're in good hands apparently. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to. Uh, eCampus Ontario for inviting me. Uh, thank you to Milan and uh, to Lillian in particular. And apparently, thank you to Laurie. Um, and you have him to blame. 
uh, if none of this is to your satisfaction in the end. Um, I also would like to thank uh, my friend and colleague, um, Benjamin Duxtater, um, who looked over my content uh, with a critical eye, and none of the mistakes are his, but I really appreciate being able to um, run things by people. I write in collaboration. We're also experimenting with live captioning. This is something that I heard was available in Google Slides, and I wanted to see if we could do it. So thank you for going along with the experiment in accessibility today at TESS 2019. Uh, so. We also have a link, and if you go to this, because not everybody likes to ask questions in front of a group of people, if you go to this link, you can ask your questions in the online environment, and then it's being mediated, and uh, I will get the questions, and also I think there'll be some interaction online. And I'll have this link up at the end as well. So, uh, I am an anthropologist. And uh, the machines I find myself within are multiple. I think we're all in a variety of machines these days. I think the relevant ones today um, are the digital machines that create the online spaces in which some of education and scholarship takes place. And also, I think the machine of education itself, which I've been a participant in basically my entire life at this point, um, and which I currently make my field site as an anthropologist. So if the cliche of my profession is that we study uh, people in villages. Uh, academia is my village. And I spend a lot of time online, uh, not just for work, alas. And uh, so I witness and participate in a lot of conversations, both as part of my anthropological approach, um, which is sort of deep hanging out, if anybody would like a, a Clifford Geertz reference. Um, but, uh, but in being online, a lot of stuff comes my way. And so when I was thinking about this talk, this thing came my way. Um, this is from the Atlantic, which is sort of equal parts fascinating and annoying, depending on what they want to write about in any given day. Um, so so th this is a very sort of get off my lawn kind of headline, too. College students just want normal libraries. Schools have been on a mission. It's very accusative. Schools have been on a mission to reinvent campus libraries, even though students just want the basics. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> so, so this led to quite a conversation with my library Twitter and also with my EdTech Twitter, and this, this kind of zero-sum game, right? Either you can have the basics, or you can have innovation. But God forbid, you would want, like, both. That's just a lot. Um, so, so the author, if you read the whole thing, the author is suggesting this sort of, you know, anything beyond the basics is just fancy, right? And I think this false dichotomy of the traditional looking past and present with the sort of whiz-bang innovative future, right, with jetpacks and stuff. Um, so this idea that to serve students well, libraries need to choose one over the other, um, and, and, and the Students think, wait, why is this doing this? It's automatically advancing, so we'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, this article suggests that libraries are not choosing wisely, right? So my argument is that the framing is all wrong. And here I'm going to refer to uh, the inside higher ed column of Barbara Pfister, who is a magical, wonderful being. Um, and also a librarian, and her column, uh, Library Babelfish, should be required reading for anybody who's doing anything in education and libraries. And so, so Barbara and I are in conversation, right? And the, the thing that I called out here is, let's give ourselves room to try new things while also maintaining things that have enduring value and stop thinking about it as a competitive zero-sum game. Please. My colleague, Katrina, who is head of a library at... Um, University of South Carolina in Lancaster makes this excellent point, right? When some people say innovation, what we should actually be talking about is creativity. And she suggests that innovation is the capitalistic weaponization of creativity. I love this point, and I think it's key. How can we have free range experimentation without creativity? What we tend to see in education is this concern with innovation. 
And so we need to talk about the relationship that it has with technology. So in April 2019, that's still this year, right? This came out. So this is from the UK. Um, and this government document is to set the vision for the use of technology and education in England. And I, I know I'm not in the UK right now, but um, I'm an anthropologist and I take a comparative approach. So the approach that this report takes is really instructive for its emphasis on markets rather than educational practice. It's very, very concerned about, in particular, the education technology markets and how you can make a situation where the players in the market, the people selling things to institutions, have more access to those institutions. That's what this report is concerned about. So this report came out just after Mr. Fitz and I um, had presented on findings from research that we had carried out in 2018-2019 on the teaching practices of lecturers in HE and FE in the UK. And so we released this report um, at just DigiFest in March, and it was the same month that the article on this work was published in the Irish Journal of Technology Enhanced Learning. Get it on newsstands now. Um, so the report and the article that we wrote describe and discuss the results of our in-depth qualitative research project. And this is what some of the analysis looked like. Um, this is coding. Um, this is <laughs> it's super fun if you do it in a group of people um, with food and drink, and it's a lot less fun if you have to do it alone in your office, on the wall, all by yourself, listening to podcasts. Um, so the research that Laurie and I did, it seems to me, is the antithesis of that Department of Education report. That report started with technology and assumed that there wasn't enough of it. Our assumptions were, first of all, people who teach have practices that involve digital. Also, that people have expertise, and they make reasoned decisions about what to do and what not to do. So in our approach to this project, we didn't start off asking about technology, even though our research questions were definitely about technology. We started off by asking about teaching. And this just gives you sort of an overview of um, who all we talked to. We, talked, we did 11 in-depth interviews. It was across a variety of disciplines. We had senior and junior staff because we wanted to get a sense of who does and doesn't have access to continuing professional development. It was what they call red brick institutions, Russell Group institutions, what post 92s, FEs. Um, we had, so those pieces of paper that I showed you in the previous slide, there were 1,500 of those. Um, and the initial analysis we did in a group. So we involved just staff, we involved academic developers, we had librarians, we had education technologists, and we had an anthropologist. Eventually, we walked into a bar. <laughs> so in talking about teaching practices, we learned a lot about the context in which people are engaged in teaching and the nature of support. And we argue after we describe what we found, the opportunities in which innovation can happen are largely invisible to staff who are struggling with institutionally provided technology and teaching environments that are barriers to their teaching. You hear the phrase, I hacked the space a lot. I had to rearrange the furniture. They handed me a piece of technology and I put it in the corner and I used this other piece of technology because it actually did what I wanted it to do. So we tried to do, I'm, I am not a visualization person. Um, we tried to do a diagram that reflects this, right? So, so you've got your institutionally provided stuff, you've got what they want to do, and what's actually possible, and maybe even what they haven't imagined yet, and these are not connected because what they want to do is often blocked by institutional stuff. So that means that the pie in the sky, gosh, what could we do? if we weren't trying to hack our spaces, that's just invisible. You can't see that at all. Although it's hard to visualize invisibility, so we did a word for it instead. So in institutional contexts where people don't have the time 
or the organizational support or access to resources that would allow for exploration around new tech or using old tech in new ways, it's not hard to see why innovation is hard to come by. And it's also easy to see that more tech or use the tech more or even create a market that's more friendly to vendors um, isn't actually going to produce more creativity or a more effective teaching and learning context. So I want to emphasize in particular the distance between, oh wait, first I want to say, in asking about teaching, we learned a lot about networks, right? And the relationships in which people learn about and develop their teaching practices. And, and we draw this out in the report as well, the importance of people's personal learning networks for their teaching practices and the importance of digital in maintaining networks, especially for people who are far away from the so-called center, right, and all the problems that that center periphery setup is. Um, so the distance between the networks people wish they had and the extra institutional structures available for the development of teaching is something that needs attention. So that's a very polite way of saying you're not helping people develop their teaching practices. If you really value teaching, you help people develop their teaching practices. You don't lecture them about how they should be using more technology or being more friendly to vendors. So I mentioned the, the sort of center periphery, right? And working in the UK, we made very, very aware of the gravity of London and how it sort of sucks all of the oxygen out of the rest of the country because everything sort of accrues to the center. Um, and people outside of London struggle to see and be seen by peers and to learn from them and to teach them about their own practices. And this is not a unique situation. I'm willing to bet that that's also a case for the greater Toronto area um, in relation to Ontario um, or even within Toronto. There's going to be pockets in any big city um, that are better resourced and more visible within networks um, than others. So the notion of hinterlands and margins is a colonial one, and I think it's one that bears scrutiny and breakdown. Because anybody's center is going to be relative to where they are. So part of what a digital connection can do is provide a chance to decenter the place with the most gravity in terms of funding and power, and it can boost the voices and the practices of folks who would otherwise have to struggle to be seen and heard. So, for instance, um, I look to practices on Twitter that decenter historic power structures. It doesn't make them go away. I'm not that kind of utopianist. Um, it gives another channel for building outside of pre-existing hierarchies, and I think it's a way to find and make an impact that hasn't historically been available to everyone. So, I've been on Twitter since 2011, um, and I can still see a big chunk of it as the, the conference that you can actually go to without the airfare and the hotel and the accommodation. Um, you can have the conversations that you would have in the meeting rooms, in the hallways, um, occasionally in other locations. Um, and digital is enabling the connections that people can make to each other. And in my own work in libraries and education technology, I am and always have been an anthropologist that comes with its own intense colonizing baggage. Um, and it's a responsibility on my part um, to be better than my discipline has historically been. For example, who's taken an anthropology class ever? And then you went on and got a real job, right? <laughs> the dedication of my dissertation says, to my parents who never told me I couldn't be an anthropologist. Um, so this is the newer, this is E.E. E. Evans Pritchard, and so the, the, the newer people, um, their encounter with the anthropology was one in which the colonial government was learning about them to try to control them. Um, and this is after uh, Pritchard's initial fieldwork in the 1920s among the Azandi in the Sudan. Um, he was hired by the Anglo-Egyptian government uh, because they were in conflict with the newer in the 1920s. So the colonial government was trying to find out more about these people so that they could control them. Now this was ultimately unsuccessful. But the governors thought that if they had more information about the people that they wanted to control, they'd be able to do it more effectively. So they brought Evans Pritchard in to do the anthropological work. Their desire for control was ultimately not met, but they tried and it was with the help of anthropologists. 
the ever charismatic Franz Boas. Um, Boas took up anthropology as his life's work after his previous academic life as a physicist. He wrote his dissertation on the color of seawater, which sounds like an art project, right? Um, he is known uh, as the father of American anthropology and is a champion of anti-scientific racism, which is a really good agenda to have. Um, however, in the late 19th and early 20th century, the extinction narrative had already quite caught hold, and indigenous people in North America were the object of study, at least in part because they were framed as disappearing. So 19th century anthropology co-occurred with the systematic dispossession, persecution, and killing of indigenous peoples. And the salvage anthropology that Boaz was particularly a part of um, in the 20th century referred to disappearing people um, as if they were fading, like in the sunlight. Um, not that they were being colonized and displaced by white settlers. And this is what scholar Eve Tuck calls replacement. Yeah? The systematic and violent substituting of white settler people for indigenous people. And anthropology is complicit in this process. We freeze people in a particular ethnographic presence, facilitating their erasure from any future and their invisibility in the present. In this picture, he's reenacting a quack, quack, quack of creation myth. Um, and that's another kind of erasure, right? Because he's representing himself in a picture that's actually someone else's story, someone else's mythology, someone else's belief. Mid-20th century, during the Second World War, anthropological knowledge was leveraged as a way to better understand, and again, presumed to control, um, the United States' conquered enemies, the Japanese. Ruth Benedict did what we call armchair anthropology, the sort of desk research anthropology, um, during World War II, and her resulting work, called The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, which has an amazing book cover. Um, the original book cover is really beautiful. Um, and it was on behalf of the U.S. military that she did this research. So then the, the anthropological work was complicit in the military mission of controlling occupied Japan. And it was based on Benedict's work during wartime. Who knows who this is? Margaret Mead. And there are problems with the stories she told and for what purpose, and I don't want to leave those out of her legacy. Um, this is the woman who wrote um, Sex and Gender. Um, she wrote Coming of Age in Samoa. Um, but in this context, I want to point to the way her particular anthropological purposes as a student of Ruth Benedict and Franz Boas shifted away from those of institutional control and erasure to one of understanding. And so it's for this that I value her work in Samoa and also in Papua New Guinea. Her intentions were to make the unfamiliar familiar, and also to make the familiar unfamiliar, to question the practices of her own culture, especially with regard to sexuality, adolescence, and child rearing. So she brought what she learned from other cultures back to her own, as a way of advocating for change. She was on, who, okay, I don't even know if you have this broadcast in Canada, Donahue Show? She was on Donahue. She published in, like, Ladies Home Journal about child rearing, and she used her anthropological perspective to say, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. There are all these other people in the world who do things differently. If this isn't working for us, let's try something else. So this is anthropology as a potentially transformative project, not a controlling one, but a transformative one, and a self-critical one, very importantly. She was not thrilled with North American culture. She thought we could do better. She looked to the practices of other people to feed her imagination about what might be possible. So why am I telling you this? A lot of you probably know the colonial history of anthropology. 
So I'm telling the story of the different agendas of anthropologists because as an anthropologist myself, I take the mission of critique and change to heart. For all of her flaws, uh, Margaret Mead wanted to use her disciplinary practices to understand and transform her own culture and change it. I don't want to facilitate the erasure of people or practices or to, with my work or my engagement with the work of educators, to suggest that I'm discovering anything. Um, settler people have a real history of doing that. So I'm concerned in my work with making practices visible so that they can be recognized, not just changed or improved. I also want, by recognition of current practice and critique of institutions, to remind people that education, schools, and libraries are built things, are cultural artifacts, and are therefore not neutral. Participation in schools is a colonial practice. One of the 94 calls in the Truth and Reconciliation Report of 2015 um, is the recent launch of a monument to 2,800 indigenous children who died in residential schools. Schools have a deadly and damaging history for indigenous people globally, and very specifically locally as well. This is the present not the past. We can't build education futures without paying attention to the harms that settler education practices have done. And we need to listen to people when they are rightfully skeptical of the place of schools in their lives and their history. The legacy of colonialism means that white people in particular have a responsibility to listen to indigenous and black and brown people. When they don't engage, or if they only engage with each other in places that do not include settler whites, there's a reason for that. These blank slides are on purpose, by the way. You're not missing anything. I'm under the impression that in this room, there are people who facilitate and support the work of teaching and learning, uh, librarians, education technologists, instructional designers, as well as teachers and professors of education. And all of you, to my mind, are also students. As people in the field of education, you, we, um, are often talked to, at, about the future of education. And it's often couched in language that betrays that they don't know much about what's going on in education. Uh, sometimes it's more about markets than education, as we saw from the UK government report. And I often see folks concerned about the future pointing to what they perceive as a deficit, often in visual capability. And they, and they propose a lack of practice to justify the change programs that they're selling. And again, because as an anthropologist, um, because I'm an anthropologist, I find this very interesting. I have been brought in as a consultant into situations where the powers that be assumed that the people working for them didn't do digital. And then it turned out, stop me if you've heard this one, I ran the workshop, and lo and behold, there was plenty of digital practice. They just weren't doing any of it in official channels. And they weren't doing it in official channels at work because they didn't feel valued or safe. So Terra Nullius is, again, the colonizing idea that that land that you just landed on is empty and therefore fair game. And I don't want to push this metaphor too far because I don't want to say that justifications for change initiatives are the same as justifications for colonization, dispossession, and genocide. That is not how far I'd like to go. But I think the terra nullius approach to digital or any practice takes away at least two things. It takes away the ability to recognize and encourage good practices. And it takes away the ability to recognize and change practices that don't currently serve anyone particularly well. So I know this room is already engaged in digital practices. It's the core of the work that you do. And if you're not yourself teaching online, you're supporting folks who are, and students who are learning online. So already, no one gets to suggest 
that you have a deficit. And there are likely choices you make about what you do and don't engage with. And this is something I see in my own work, again, not just with teachers, but also with students. They will do what they have to in particular systems, but maybe not all of the things you would like for them to do. These choices are not coming from a place of incapability or ignorance, but from knowing what you do and don't want to do. Fundamental to anthropological approaches is the idea that everyone has a reason for doing the things they do. There is a logic to human behavior. And if you don't understand that logic, it's not because they are stupid. It's because you don't know what it is yet. So creativity cannot happen if people are having to fight the systems in which they work to do the basic things or if they're being punished for their informed choices by using systems that are in opposition to the ways they want to teach. I see this in the approach to turn it in, for instance. There will be institutional mandates to use turn it in, but there are people whose pedagogy is diametrically opposed to everything that turn it in represents as a practice. So I think the perceived lack of innovation that some people get accused of is not about digital capability or incapability, but about systems that get in the way of practice. And I want to invoke again my friend Katrina. We should be talking about creativity here. And this is an example of a project that I did with active learning classrooms at UNC Charlotte when I was still affiliated with them. And um, my colleague Susan is an education professor. And before UNC Charlotte built purpose-built active learning classrooms, she had this kit in a bag. This was her active learning classroom kit. And she would take it to fixed seating lecture halls. She would take it to rooms that were not set up with writing surfaces. And she would transform any space that she was in into an active learning classroom by virtue of having this kit. So this is her, this is Susan packing the physical space of wherever she needed to teach. So I wonder, you know, what would the digital equivalent of this bag of tricks be? If you're presented with a digital environment that doesn't do the things that you want it to do, do you have a bag like Susan has a bag? Um, does it mean you meet mandates when you can, right? Do you put content in the system as a shell, um, but then use another non-institutional system, uh, class discussions in Slack, um, student groups on Facebook? There are all sorts of non-institutional um, examples of this sort of thing. So I want to say again, current systems of inequality, of racism, of colonization, and sexism are baked into current practice. All of the digital things that we're handed are built by people who come from a culture that has these problems. So it's not ever going to be enough to identify effective practice. We have to ask questions about what is effective, what is not effective, and why. So when thinking about practice and fit, and transformation, and innovation, we need to think about for whom, and at whose expense. Building a future grounded in present practice, informed by what should change, as well as what's already effective. And I think center and periphery aren't exclusively results of colonial practices, but I think they're characteristically so. So what if we try to dispense with the idea that the center contains the most important and most primary practices? What if we pay attention to the local wherever we find it? If we listen to the people in our respective communities and are guided by them, then we don't have to worry so much about center and periphery. So I'll cite again the work of Eve Tuck, and uh, this time uh, an article that she wrote with her colleague um, Ruben Gaston Vide Fernandez. They write of a subtler futurity where the future is imagined much like the colonized past and present, which has replaced indigenous people with settler whites, 
and requires all people to assimilate to structures and behaviors that center whiteness, what they call the white stream. So the assimilation narrative is a really strong one that's been going for a long time. And what their argument is, is that if we've already got these processes that are erasing indigenous people from the past and erase them from the present, it is impossible to imagine them in the future. So that is settler futurity. I think there are some excellent antidotes to settler futurity, and I see it um, in science fiction. And this is the work. Has anybody read Nettie Okorafor's stuff? She's an African futurist, and her work is fantastic. And so I encourage you to read the Vinci trilogy. Um, she also writes what she calls African fantasy um, or African jujuism. And uh, so she crosses genres. But what she's explicitly doing in all of her work, she's also an excellent follow on Twitter. She has an amazing, weird cat that has his own, um, his own account. <laughs> um, but when you read the stuff that she writes about her work, she says, I am insisting that my people will be in the future. And that is the future that I write, because my people are in the present and my people are in the past. And so she is writing the future that she wants to imagine, and she is inhabiting that future with her people. And she gets really rightfully annoyed when people ask her questions like, when are you going to write about white people? Right? This is the Toni Morrison response to this. You don't know what a racist question that is that you are asking me. When am I going to write about white people? So she gets very similar questions to what Toni Morrison does. So there's an initiative for indigenous futures that has a very similar project, where you're making and imagining their futures not consigned to a past and not erased from the present. And this is a refusal of settler futurity, an insistence that indigenous people will create their own future with themselves in it. And supporting indigenous and black futurity will require of white people, she said, a white woman, advisedly, um, that they not act that they not speak, and occasionally not know what's going on. So I want to point again to the history of anthropology that is one of understanding practice, but not always valuing it. Anthropology was traditionally about learning and gaining critical insight from the practices of the other, so maybe we can have it be people who are not you instead of the other. Um, and we can try to take away some of the essentializing problems around other and people. What can people who have historically been centered, white, settler, cishet people, what can we learn when we decenter our own practices, when we step back and learn from the practices of people who are not that, who are not me? And what happens when white people accept that we don't always know what's happening, and that's okay? When met with a refusal that requires recognition and respect, not an insistence that historically marginalized, racialized, and colonized people have to listen or should teach us, right? So how do we learn from people without insisting that they teach us things? Rather than periphery, right, let's say local, what are the local practices that emerge from the priorities of the communities in which you work that can guide and contextualize teaching and learning practices? I think mean, digital gives us access to networks of people who can share practice and make room for creativity. We don't need corporations for creativity. We need community and support, like it tests. So who gets to experiment is a really important question to ask. Who decides what counts as impact? This is where critical considerations of power is key. In a time of austerity, we must not choose basics instead of creativity. We don't have to do that false dichotomy that I started off with in the Atlantic article. Our community deserves better. In times of austerity, the creativity that people do have ends up being pointed at making do, not always more with less, but the challenge of the same with less. 
if you have the power to experiment, if you have the space to be creative and have it be recognized as extra, not just making do, how do you share that? If you have the power to experiment, on whose behalf can you make room? Are you white? Are you male? Who around you can you share your privilege with? We need to advocate for centering historically marginalized voices and experiences. How can we support people to find their own answers? How can we encourage the centering of people who have historically been marginalized to make their concerns and practices the drivers of change and maintenance in educational contexts? So I think we need praxis. We need that practice in a context of critical reflection and analysis. And we also need collective action. This is not something that in any one individual person um, can do and affect lasting and constructive change. And I think then we have a really solid foundation for a future that learns from the present and a way to avoid being cogs in our respective machines. I want to help create spaces for building the future that I want to see. Don't wait around for someone to predict your future for you. The idea that we would simply be handed a future, a predetermined future, is terrifying. I find it terrifying. The future has to be co-created. In spaces like TESS, um, in online sharing spaces, where people find opportunities to connect and learn and create new work out of existing practice, that is where the future can emerge from. These are the places and methods for embedding our practices and our human relationships. This is where we build the future of education. And I'm glad to be in one of those spaces now. And I look forward to learning from you all. Thanks so much, Donna, for an inspiring kickoff test. Architecting a community future is a great message to leave with us, so I think uh, everyone appreciates it very much. We have some questions that were we already uh, have questions. sourced cool. from the audience during the presentation, and uh, we'd like to really uh, capture those questions now and point them to you and see if uh, you would like to take one or more of them on. Can we have those questions up on the screen, please? Ooh, up on the screen. Somebody will have to read them to me. <laughs> uh, what is one piece of advice you would give to future librarians, given future the context librarians. of your remarks this morning? Oh, so this is a piece of advice I have given before. Get out of the library. Um, libraries exist in larger contexts. And if you think that the work that you do as a librarian is only in the building or only with librarians or even only just with, you know, the particular people that you've been assigned to work with, you're going to do less than you could. Um, then if you position yourself as a colleague, as a member of the larger community of the university and even of the community in which your um, educational institution is, is a part of. Yeah, so, so, so be more than the library, because the fact is that students and faculty don't just do their stuff in the library. So if you want to know, if you want to connect with what their practices are, you can't learn about it just based on what's happening in the library. That's a piece in isolation, and people's learning landscapes is so much bigger than that. What elements of anthropology would you suggest that educators take into their classes? So the perspective that I was advocating for in this talk is the biggest thing, right? I, I, want, I want for there to be an acknowledgement that whoever you're encountering, whether it's students or faculty or colleagues, everybody is already doing a thing. And there are reasons that they are doing those things. And so your job as an educator 
all appearances to the contrary historically, is not to fill people with content. It's to engage them in processes of education so that they can use content as a context for which to acquire the facilities that we need people to have in critical thinking, in uh, retaining and absorbing information, right? All of, all of these things that, that educators do, right? What do you think about high-risk innovation? Do you want to innovate, but your institution may penalize you when things go wrong or students are unhappy due to breaking the mold of how things have been traditionally done? So this is a leadership problem. So if you're at an institution where you say, hey, I want to try something, and I'm not sure how it's going to work yet. I'm not sure if the students are going to be super happy about it. But I think, I think it'll pay off in the end. So this was the experiment, actually, that UNC Charlotte did with active learning. And I say experiment advisedly because the active learning model is, what, 30, 35 years old? This, this, this is not rocket surgery, right? It's, it's, it's not, like, the evidence base is there. So the idea that it's super experimental is already a problem. But um, they put in these classrooms, and they put together a community of practice around the classrooms. And one of the things they wanted to protect people against is the student evaluation thing. Because in the same way that people are told teaching is, she said on stage, standing on stage and talking to people, right? I'm not teaching you guys right now. I'm talking to you. Um, students are told that learning is sitting in the audience and listening to somebody. So if you come into a room full of students who think it's all going to be, you know, goodwill hunting, um, and, and you're like, you're going to sit at tables, and you're going to talk to each other, and you're going to learn from each other, and they say, I'm paying tuition money for you people to teach me. What the actual, you know, they're very upset. So leadership and transparency is really, really important. So some of the most effective people in those classrooms would start off every semester and sometimes every class session saying, this is how I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you in a way such that you will be engaging with each other, and these are the reasons why I'm doing it. These are the reasons why I'm not just standing up in front of the classroom and talking to you. And when they did lecture, they would say, these are the reasons that I'm lecturing, and this is what we're going to do today. So every time they would explain. They never assumed that the student knew that. Their heads of department also protected them from student evaluations tanking their professional and also, student evals are a whole other, right, that, it's a problem. Um, so you have to recognize that that kind of, it no longer becomes risk-taking if we accept that trying different things might not work the way we think it does. So it requires a reframe around experimentation so that nothing is actually a failure. It's just, oh, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> You could be here for a long time based on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will say I will, I will be here through the day. I will be here at lunch. I am happy to chat with people. So when you say there's no more time, we'll, we'll stop. Well, let me there. pitch a, a few more to you. And this one, I, I, I expect you'll know the reference. Is Kate Fox's Watching the English a model for watching faculty or watching students in the wild? In the wild. So, so there is a popular genre of books that sort of kind of pretend to be anthropology, right? I think watching the English is more of a travelogue book myself. I think there is stuff that we can learn from travel writers, but I would say that the original model for travel writers is the, like, Victorian traveling, oh, look at those people, aren't they strange and exotic kind of thing. So maybe maybe we wouldn't take that model. But I, but I do think the idea that you can watch and learn from people um, and make them more comprehensible by trying. What about Hutchins' Cognition in the Wild? Are you familiar with that work? I am not. Okay. So that was a study of how uh, navigators do their work, navigators in Polynesia and navigators mm -hmm. around the world. And it was really about the, the tacit knowledge that is passed between people um, who understand the culture deeply yes. and understand the past. So it's very bound sure. by context mm -hmm. and bound by tradition. And also, 
requires you spending time so that you can learn the stuff that people don't say out loud. Right? That, yeah. that there are unspoken things. There's always, and, and Laurie and I do workshops around tacit assumptions, right? Because you've got like organizational stuff that there's the stuff you say you do, right? right? And then there's the stuff that you say you value. And then there's the stuff that actually happens, right? And, and the difference between those, th this is the difference between um, the ideal kinship chart that we, anthropologists used to be obsessed with kinship charts, right? It was like all of the triangles and the squares and all the lines and everything. But when you would, when you would talk to people about their actual kinship models, it was just a sea of dotted lines and crossed out stuff. And, you know, this person says they're related to them, but actually they were, you know, the, the messy reality is much more difficult to represent. This one's kind of counter uh, to the argument this morning. Is innovation not the outcome of creativity and action? So I suppose it could be if you were making a different argument. Um, I think that for the purposes of what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to say that innovation is being defined in a very particular way that we can, sure, in an ideal world, innovation would just be like that thing that emerges from creativity, but I see them as coming from very different places. And I'm framing creativity here as the grassroots thing that we would like to happen. And innovation is the same as being marketed to you. This one's a big one. No, no. <coughs> when we vacate the center, is it really fair to those who have been excluded historically to close it off to them in the present and future by moving only to community? No, because I think that there might be a misunderstanding of what I mean by not talking about centers anymore. I'm not suggesting that we say to people, um, there is no influential place where ideas emerge from, right? Um, and, and I don't think that you would even necessarily say there is no center. There might be like multiple ones. I think that for me, the turn to community is an attempt to make it so that, precisely this, so that people who have had voices have to recognize that there are historical reasons that they have a voice in the first place and to think about the, the, the process that is necessary to make it more possible for more people to have voices. I don't think we're going to get to all of the questions. <laughs> but I definitely, oh, three more minutes. Okay, cool. One more question. This one's near and dear to our hearts in, uh, in Ontario. What is the role of free online textbooks in the decolonization of the classroom? So I'm going to follow Eve Tuck here and say that decolonizing is about giving back the land, right? So open textbooks can be about social justice. It is unclear to me the extent to which it could actually be about giving back the land. If you want to go a little bit metaphorical on it, you can talk about giving back space, right? So where textbooks come from is a little bit of a center periphery problem. Um, and so whose voices get represented in textbooks is something that open resources can have a, a role in doing. And, and just from a um, U.S. perspective, the cost of commercial textbooks is definitely a social justice issue. Like it's an additional tariff on our students. It's, it's an additional burden. Um, and we have students having substandard experiences in their education because they cannot engage with the commercial stuff. Um, because of price. And finally, where did you get that suit? <laughs> I got it from Bowdoin. It's a UK company, and they uh, torture me on a regular basis with their catalogs. And I, I knew I was coming to give this talk, and I said I could stand up there in a blue floral velvet suit. So. Thank you, Donna. <laughs>